Uh, this is kind of new technology for us to do this in a classroom and we have another classroom that's listening in at BIU which is Vancouver Island University so welcome to those participants as well um, and someone I overheard someone ask a, a colleague what's a webinar so a uh, great question a web is a, a webinar is a web seminar so we're using the internet to connect what's happening in this room with what's happening at BIU and then I'm also recording this session and we're going to be posting it online so other students can listen to the content of the presentation that way. So I'm just going to squiggle this over there. There we go. And what we're going to do is we're going to leave the questions to the end just to try and keep things manageable between the two locations. Um, and of course the slides aren't advancing. The one thing we need to have happen. Yes, yes, indeed. Hmm. No, that's not good. Okay. Well, I know the students that were here working away yesterday, I said, you're my witnesses that I am coming in and testing everything and that it works. And of course, for some reason, I'm just going to try uh, again to start this. There we go. Today we are going to be talking about project change. I'm going to tell you um, a little bit of the nitty gritty information about how to register as well. Um, I'm going to talk about some past winners just to see if you know we can get the creative juices flowing that way. And then Jim is going to take over on the headset and he is going to share some really cool information about the things that PowerSmart has have been doing as really leaders in this area of helping people to change their behaviors and change um, the way they see things, and then we'll have the Q&A at the end. So I'm going to launch right into what Project Change is all about. It started four years ago at Capilano University, and it was the brainchild of an instructor named Joe Kelly. And Joe uh, was teaching and thought, you know, these students are really hungry to make a difference. How could we turn this into something fun? And so it was almost like a little bit of a competition. He said, let's invite other schools. And it just grew into this huge provincial kind of event. And we get asked this all the time. Well, Link BC is a tourism and hospitality education network. Why would you run something like Project Change? But I think for most of us, it's obvious, right? Our tourism environment, our hospitality environment, is the community. It's either the natural environment or it's the people that live in our communities that make our industry so successful. So if we make our communities stronger, then we can have a stronger tourism and hospitality industry. Plus the fact that it just feels good to make a difference in the world. And I know you guys are hungry to do that. So uh, with that in mind, I'll just touch on the, you know, the nuts and bolts of project change. Most of you know that um, now is the time that you can actually register for project change. Just lets us know who's participating. Uh, you're going to be working away on your projects and depending on whether you're listening from VIU or you're here at CAP or what school you're at, you're going to have your own timeline within your course. And then all the projects are due at the end of March next year and we will evaluate the projects uh, at that time. So the way that you register, I'm actually going to walk you all through this and then hopefully you can help your colleagues and then especially since we're recording this, we can refer people to this video. You're going to go to the website studytourismnbc.com or .ca and on that website you're going to click on the purple tab at the top that says current students. So you're going to be on a page that looks like this, current students. And you're going to click on the button that says Project Change. And you're going to notice the beautiful plug for our friends at BC Hydro Power Smart to the side of that. And you're going to go into the Project Change page. And that PDF with that arrow that was talking about Project Change, that's where it says click here to download an overview of Project Change. Feel free to get, grab a copy of that and review that anytime because um, it contains a lot of information you need. But you're going to click on Event Attendance like an event and then you're going to fill out the form so I started filling this out and I said well my team name is banana pants and I go to BCIT and I'm going to save that and it's going to save to my events now if you don't if you've never been to our website before it might walk you through some steps of like who are you what school do you go to what's your email address that's all really really helpful but essentially what you're trying to get to is You've registered for this event called Project Change. Now you can go into My Events 
and you can click on the project change button that I just showed and you can upload your file. So these are two separate steps, right? You're registering for project change and then when your project is ready for us to look at it, you're going to upload it using this website. And you're going to browse through your computer, you're going to say here's my file, and then you're going to upload it and then to the right you'll see where it says my files project change and if someone on your team says wait, I forgot this picture or whatever, you can delete it out and upload it again um, until you're satisfied with it. And all of this is available if you see under account, account, my events, update, log out. You can always come back to your project change profile and upload that content and update it. So what is that content? She's talking about that content. What is project change? What do students do in project change? Well. I'll tell you from my experience that the best projects that have come through in the last four years are ones that um, come from the student's passion. So we can pretty much tell right off the hop when students are passionate about what they're working on and when they're not. Like it just shines through the project. So something that students are passionate about, something that gives them a bit of a purpose. Teamwork, even when it's falling apart, the teams that are aware of the process are the ones that tend to do really well. So we've had teams win project change where they've had a total meltdown in their team and what they're handing in isn't really what they wanted to do, but because they actually address that in what they're submitting, they say, look, you know, we looked at the situation, we realized that our team wasn't communicating or we should have started earlier or whatever. Just addressing that is something that the judges really respond to. Um, and then good reporting, so documenting what's happening and sharing with us really effectively. And so there's two rounds to project change. One is that Link BC reviews it, and then the top 50% of those go on to a judging panel, which is an external judging panel that reviews the projects. So this is a picture from the award ceremony last year, and um, we celebrated a number of projects. I want to emphasize we had, you know, 20 something projects come in and so these are just a few of them. The first place winner last year was a project called Crowdfunding for Tafin and this was Lilo May. She's actually um, a, was a CAP student. She's from Vietnam and she was raising money for a special purpose building in her home community to be like a marketplace, a village marketplace there. So um, she raised over $12,000 in 60 days. Boom, that's a great result. Um, she documented where the contributions were coming from. She had great ideas on how to kind of pay back contributors through her crowdfunding. And she also talked about her next steps. So what she submitted to us was just a really, really clean document. It was just, this is what I did, and here are some pictures of what I did. And it didn't have to be this huge essay. In fact, we discouraged that strongly. It just really clearly said, this is what I did, and this is why I did it. And here's a picture of her with her prize at our award ceremony last year. And I saw some pictures of her online. She, one of her prizes was a helicopter tour with HeliJet. So that was pretty cool. She was enjoying that. Completely opposite direction at North Island College, they realized they don't have compost on campus. So they took some really basic steps to make a difference. First of all, they collected signatures to show to the administration, hey, this is something that people care about. They hosted a composting day on campus. They physically collected compost from students, again, so they could show back to the admin, hey, we held an event, we asked people to compost, we had a little compost bin, and we collected 10 pounds of compost in this, in this event. Um, and so the composting receptacles that they created are still around the campus. Um, they have this goal of how much compost to create. And so there's that legacy component to what they've done. It's really going to live on in their campus and it's going to make a real difference. And so um, I believe this team won some gift certificates to some really amazing restaurants downtown from Tourism Vancouver. Uh, Vancouver Island University had a number of good projects. One of the ones that resonated with me was the Food Sustainability Project. And so they had different groups come and test um, this local soup that was made all of local in ingredients and then, you know, talk to them about food sustainability. And they actually were on the local news and got lots of media attention for their cause as well.
Bikes for Tykes, some of you might, uh, especially the Reckies, might be familiar with this project. Last year, um, these two young men raised uh, over $10,000 worth of helmets for a Bikes for Tykes program. So they saw an existing not-for-profit, which is Bikes for Tykes, giving bikes to kids on the North Shore. And they said, is there anything you need? And they said, well, yeah, we're giving these bikes to these kids, and they need helmets. And the these are underprivileged families, and bike helmets are expensive. So they got to work. They got the rights to show the Red Bull Rampage at the Narrows Pub. And at that event, they had a silent auction. You know, they did a beer and a burger ticket. So this doesn't have to be fancy. This doesn't have to be, you know, crazy academic. It can be a super fun event where people come together. And at the end of the day, they raised this money, and they were really smart. They got corporate donors. They said, well, if we raise... $2,000. If you use $2,500, would you match that? So corporate funder one said, sure. And then they said to corporate funder two, well, if we raise this much, would you match that? So they actually took the money that they raised and doubled it and then doubled it again. And that is a really smart idea that our judges thought, um, you know, was very impressive. And here they are winning their prize uh, at, their, at the event last year. Douglas College, kind of a different bent, went to the local elementary school. They did a, a supplies drive. So again, underprivileged kids going to school. They don't have what they need. This is really important. They went to the school. They went to the organizations that are already working in that area and said, what do you need? And this is where the projects get really effective because they did a little bit of homework and they actually found out exactly what they should be doing and then they went and did it. So that's a little bit about project change and some past ideas. I'm going to turn it over to our main event, and Jim is going to talk to you about the work that's done at BC Hydro and BC Hydro Power Smart. Um, thanks very much for your attention so far. Over to Jim. Great, thank you. So you do have to wear yes, the, the yes, space helmet. Yes, unfortunately. Yeah. All right, hopefully everybody on the island can hear me. Hi, everybody. So yeah, my name is Jim Nelson, and I have a team of about 40 marketing professionals, and we run 15 PowerSmart programs, and we partner with large companies like Home Depot, Best Buy, Canadian Tire to get our products and services out to the, to the public. So what I want to talk to you today about, which will fit perfectly with your project, and I also wanted to say this isn't just about sustainability and conservation. You can use these principles that we talk about in anything that you choose to do in your career and I can 100% guarantee for you that this doesn't always work <laughs> but if you follow these types of principles you can get some good results and a lot of it is really common sense so what I hope you take away from all this you understand a little bit about these theories uh, for those of you that maybe haven't taken sociology psychology or it's been a while hopefully we can reconnect with some of that and then I'll share with you some of our favorite tools that we use to do our thinking so I want to take you behind the scenes of what we do in PowerSmart. So I'm not going to actually get into any of our PowerSmart campaigns or anything like that. It's more when one of my team members is trying to design something or create something with a partner, these are the steps that they go through to think about. And I'll take you back quite a ways. Back in the, in the 70s, there was a lot of interesting things that happened, but it was actually also the birth of social marketing. So I'm not talking about social media. Marketing is a concept uh, that was born out of the idea of let's use marketing principles for good to try and change things. And <clears throat> when I was a youngster, and this obviously is dating myself, but this was actually the first social media camp or social marketing campaign. I'll try and do the audio here. Forgive me, there's going to be a big uh... There we go. All right. Uh oh, now we've got the... What's up, Lizzie? The schoolyard's a mess. Look at that. Boom. And that. Yeah. Some people just don't know what trash cans are for. So stop littering, Lizzie. Great. Now we can each pick up a litter bit. I will. Go so on. I thought first. Okay, let's go. Thanks, kids. If everybody does their part, we'll keep America looking good. <laughs> so that was what TV was like when I was seven. 
it's come a long way. So it actually, as cheesy as it was and as, as silly as it was, they actually did a lot of great things and used a lot of great principles in that whole campaign. And if you ask your parents, I'm sure that 99% uh, of them remember that campaign vividly and can recite the give a hoot uh, part of it. So, oops, oh, not again. <laughs> Once is plenty. So, so the other thing that I'll share with you today is all the stuff I'm going to show you, it's not rocket science. A lot of it probably will be common sense for you, but it is good for you just to rethink about it and, and to follow these steps because sometimes you just decide, oh, I don't need to bother with that or, or that's not going to work for my initiative and you, you completely forget about them. So here's the 10 items and you're all thinking, oh my God, we're going to go through all 10 of these. Again, they're pretty simple and just to make it more uh, digestible. Just think of it as three major things that we're going to talk about. One is to better understand people, and then how do you connect with those people, and then finally how do you help people succeed, or how do you help them with that change. So I was never any good at bibliographies in school, but this is basically mine. Um, lots of different sources for this, including our 25 years of experience of running PowerSmart, and a lot of interesting experts that will share some of their information <coughs> today as well. First one, for you again, we, we get some weird looks sometimes when I say you've got to think about people, not customers. And people and then people look at me and say, well, that just sounds like semantics. People are customers. What are you talking about? What it meant for us, and, and it could apply to your projects as well, is we were focused too narrowly on people thinking about them as a BC Hydro customer. So how they use electricity, maybe what they live in. But the sad truth is that people don't care all that much about electricity use or electricity conservation. So you've got to try and touch on other things in their lives that they are passionate about. And then you can find those other ends with people, whether it's their kids or their passion for cycling or their passion for hockey, whatever it might be. That might be your in to connect to and make a difference to get your change happening. So unfortunately, there are some barriers that uh, hinder us from making change. One of the big ones we face is that, and you hear this a lot, is people will say, well, somebody will figure this out. So whether it's greenhouse gases or generating electricity, someone will find some, someone smart will find some technology that can help generate electricity. So that's going to be their first um, barrier for them or that they're going to throw up as far as an excuse why they don't need to do this because in 10 years, scientists will figure out how to generate electricity, in this case, using these interesting blips. Another one that really affects us in two ways is that humans naturally discount the future, whether it's good things or bad things. If you Google this, there's been tons of studies that if you offer somebody $5 today versus $100 tomorrow, the vast majority of people want it now. And obviously there's some trust issues perhaps with that, but it's been repeated several times that any problem in the future, um, if you look at any sort of health studies, you know, they'll discount the effect of that, that they'll get cancer in 20 years. Oh, that's not going to happen to me. Or uh, any of the uh, climate change, global warming issues. People just believe that that is something so far out there they don't have to worry about. And then similarly for us, we like to talk about you're going to save all this electricity and it's a great business case for you. You're going to save a lot of money on your electricity bill over the next 10 years. As you can imagine, the discount that saving stream and, and really don't value it. They only look at what's it costing me or saving me today. Another one that's really important is this idea called single action bias. In this example, what it means is, okay, well, I ran on the treadmill this morning, so in an extreme case, now I can enjoy my cigar. And for ours, we'll say, we'll see, you know, oh, I put in an LED light, so now I can leave it on all the time, or I can use more electricity because I've done my part. And you'd see that a lot also with Prius drivers that, oh, you know, I'm doing my part for the environment here, I drive a Prius, but now I'm going to waste in other places. And it's not a conscious thing, but they do feel like they've done all they can. So that's an important one to remember with your initiatives. And there's a whole bunch of cognitive biases and, and issues that we face. Again, anybody, does anybody take psychology or sociology? No one? Yeah? Everyone? No? No. No, you got to take psychology. It's the best. So all these fancy words, you can probably guess, it just means that people don't like to change or there's resistance to change for several, several reasons and you've just got to be aware of that. So I guess we should all give up and not do this project, not do PowerSmart. It's not all bad. 
there are things that also help us or that we can try and leverage around the brain science. One that we use a lot is this notion called laddering up. And it's, it's, it's almost the opposite of the single action bias, and so you have to, do have to be aware of that. But the idea here is get somebody to do something small, and then relatively quickly or in short order, follow up with them again and ask them to do that next step. So then the first thing doesn't seem that hard, and they'll be more willing to do the next thing. So yeah, you got to watch that if you leave it too long, then they'll, they will start to think, well, I've done my part, I'm as power smart as I can be, or I'm as environmentally friendly as I can be. I'm going to do these other wasteful behaviors. Another neat one that's related is you can also change the way people perceive themselves. So with that first small step, if you think strong about your language, when you go back to them, you can say, now that you're somebody that cares about the environment, or now that you're someone who's passionate about energy efficiency, we've got this great next thing that you should do. Or, hey, why don't you work with your neighbors to start a new program? And the person will be, yeah, you know, I am one of those people. I, I believe that. And then they'll do what you want them to. So that's an important one. And it really does work. And then ones that you've obviously heard of before, um, but the concept of bandwagon effect, it's also called the availability cascade. A little bit of a nuance, but basically, if you're seeing people do this stuff or you're hearing about people doing it, then there's much more likelihood that they'll ask about it or want to get involved. So again, total common sense, and, and you guys use that probably in all of your, a lot of the work you look at, but that one's really important. What are some tools that we use when we're looking at our offers? So obviously, we want to do research, quantitative or qualitative, that's all great, but I generally don't want people to stop there, or I don't want them to rely on that. And one that you can do for this project, which is really easy, you could actually forget the quantitative research, the survey stuff, go right to the observation research. So either watch people shop, watch people do whatever area you're interested in, talk to them a little bit if you want, but you actually can get a lot simply from observation. So this is, of course, Jane Goodall working with chimpanzees and gorillas. Uh, we can do the exact same thing, and we've done that in several places. And then, again, I'll date myself, but uh, many, many, many years ago, Seymour Ski Hill actually had a $7 lift ticket offer that was during the, the midweek. They wanted to get people because it was obviously a slow time. Uh, and what we did, rather than doing a survey, we just rode the chairlift with people and talked to them, asked them to show us things that they liked and didn't like. You get way more rich information. We'll also look at um, how do people shop for lighting products in Home Depot. And one, one of our managers actually just watched the people shopping. They didn't talk to anybody, but they learned a whole ton about how they look at products, what they use for point of sale material to be, to be educated. They actually saw them also talking to other customers about what they liked and what they wanted to choose. So a really important one, really easy, uh, particularly for your project, this is the way to go. Once you get into your careers, this is the danger that you will slip into just wanting to work on the day-to-day, -day. oh, I'll just get a survey done and get to read the results. I don't have two days where I can go out in the field and watch people do their shopping or whatever, and that's, that's dangerous. Always try to make time for that. <clears throat> Another really important one is what we like to say, talk to the people who don't like your green eggs and ham. So who are the people that hate what you've got to sell or what you're trying to do and understand what it is that they hate about it or what they refuse to want to accept uh, with your change idea or what you want to do. And then maybe you can make some subtle adjustments or address some of the barriers that they tell you about. So a really important one. Similarly, or on the flip side of it, you also want to look at what's working well. So who are the people that really do like the offer or using it? What are we call bright spots? And, and I got that from a book called Switch, which is actually a really useful book for the topic that you're looking at here. What they talk about in the book is that if you think about all the emotionally charged words in the English language, about 70% of those words are actually negative. So the example that I use, and maybe in the book as well, but if you come home with your, your report card back in, in high school or even with university and you got a bunch of A's and one D, what did most of the time get spent talking to your parents about? Was it those all the A's you did well on or was it the one thing that you failed? For me, it was the one thing that I failed or did bad at. Similarly, in business, you will find or you've heard people talk about, whenever we go into a meeting, the first thing we say is, okay, what are the problems we got to solve? Or in, even in business school, you look at, okay, well, we've got to look at the threats that are happening here and, and how do we take advantage of these problems? And, and all. So it's definitely always focus on what's not working and how do you fix it. So always spend that time about what is going well 
as well. Consider that in what you want to do, and then you can extrapolate that to other people. So that is a fascinating book if you're if you're interested. It's written by the Heath brothers, and they've done two. Um, I've got a couple other slides, but one is Switch, and the other one is Made to Stick. So again, really easy reads, great for this. And, and I'm sure you all use this as well, but it's been great for our team, again, to reconnect to sociology, psychology, all the things that we had studied years ago, but never have the time to read papers on. So TED is great for getting that. Your 20-minute bite-sized, very dynamic content helps you to learn a lot about these areas and gives you some ideas about what you can do. Another tool that we love that we use for brainstorming and, and again, trying to understand the, the people that we're trying to market to is this idea of a, of a life mapping. And you put your uh, persona in the middle. So it could be a real person that you know is involved in the activity you want to sell to them or involve them in. It could be fictional people. You get your group together and you brainstorm them in those different areas. What's important to them? What do they do in their life? And another neat one that we learned, which is really cool, if you ever do brainstorming, it's probably always with post-it notes and you're always probably writing down ideas. In fact, if you can actually get people to draw or scribble when you do this brainstorming, it ignites a lot of creativity in people because it's using that other side of their brain. It's fun. People laugh and bug each other about their terrible drawings, but you get some neat ideas about what, what they do in their life. It's also important in the previous slide, I hate, 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 hate when I come into a room, it's a brainstorming session. And it's like, okay, what are we going to do? Let's brainstorm this. And it's this big, wide open, open idea of, of just throwing out ideas. What ends up happening is you'll get 20 interesting ideas that come up and then people will peter out. If you work in these ideas of sections, so you know, let's talk about their family now for five or 10 minutes. Let's move on. And you do these categories of brainstorming, you'll get 20 great ideas in each of those categories. So now you've got 100 or, 100 or 200 of these great ideas compared to the 20 that you would have got once in the open brainstorming. Another real simple tool, but it's, it's one of my favorites, is what we call the train station. And all you do, again, draw out a line with lots of points along it, and then put the desired activity that you want people to do right in the middle of it. And then what you have to do as a team, or you can do this as an individual, individual is brainstorm all the things that you think has to happen leading up to that point. So who do people talk to? Where do they research things? Where do they go? to look at different options, um, what experts do they consult, then you have that activity that you want them to do. And then the one thing, or the things that people always forget, okay, well, I got them, good, let's move on. You forget about all the follow-up activities that we should do, A, to make them feel positive about it, that it was the right thing to do. They also have the ability to get you more participants or new people to bring, it, bring in. So what are all the follow-on activities that you want to do after the desired activity to make sure that you, you fully leverage that. So again, just a brainstorming tool, nothing uh, amazing about it other than it forces people to zero in on those, those actions. We got this idea from uh, a group that was asked to come in and work with Amtrak to redesign their seats in the States. They needed a new, uh, a new seat design for their trains. And then they started talking about it and realized, well, is that really the, the issue that you're trying to solve, is that your seats are uncomfortable? And they started talking about, well, no, it's actually people are finding it hard to figure out where to get the, how to get tickets, how to plan their trip. And then this train station at the other city, that's not what their destination is, right? They don't want to hang out in the train station in Paris. They've got a hotel to get to or attractions to get to. So how can the company, the train company, help them to reach their final destination? How do they follow up with them after about how their vacation was and, you know, can you uh, refer us to your friends or here's a 20% uh, off coupon for the next time you use Amtrak. All those types of things. So really useful, really helpful. So we've been through one. The others go pretty quick. So if you're all getting nervous, you still have half an hour of this. Uh, theme number two, connect with people. So how do you create that excitement? How do you help them understand why this is important? How do you get that conversation started? The water cooler talk is what I like to call it. First thing, and I guess it seems obvious, but you've got to try and connect to things that they care about. So you might be talking to some people that are super passionate about um, helmets for kids or, or composting, but likely those are those extreme people that are really, really into this uh, cause or this, this offer. You need to get that, that um, 
early majority or that other group of people that are kind of on the fence or neutral, how do you make them care about it? So they probably care about wanting to be part of the crowd or they want to care about something for their family. Any of those things, you've got to try and identify that and tap into it. Another interesting way to do that is you have to think about when are people receptive to you connecting with them. And, and the obvious version of this is all the telemarketers that call at 6 o'clock in the evening. They obviously haven't thought about this and they're connecting with families. Well, no, that's the worst time you could call somebody because they're with their kids, they're having dinner, they're sitting down for the first time after a crazy day. So what, whoever it is that you're trying to target, try and pick those points. For you guys, it'll be not so much in the year or the life or the year, but maybe in the, in the week or the day, when is the best time to approach people with your cause or your change activity. Another fun one, we all think that everybody's logical, so I'm going to present my argument as to why you're going to save thousands of dollars and you should therefore do this. Or the environment is being destroyed, so you must do this. It's just common sense. So we think that everybody's like Mr. Spock, but in fact we're a lot more like Homer, maybe not physically, but we all like to think about things more emotionally. Another good example from the book Switch is, is an exact same analogy. What they talk about is that if you think about the rider and the elephant, the rider is the logical you. So we often try and appeal to the rider and say to them, you've got to do this because. You need to exercise more because it's good for your health, uh, good for your heart, you'll lose weight. The rider will go, yep, that makes sense. I'm logical just like you. I'm going to pull on the, the reins of the elephant and I'll get to move him. And the elephant, you know, they'll humor the rider. They'll move a little bit for maybe a day, a week, but then they get tired of that and they go back to their old habits or what they're emotionally connected to. So make sure that don't just, uh, don't just appeal to the logic, try and connect to that emotional, the elephant in this case. I mentioned this book too and often when I do this, we don't have time today, but I'll try and go through a summary of this book. Uh, again, really re easy to read. Some great common sense tips that I love to use there. Um, biggest one, keep it simple. And, and I think you might experience this with these ideas that you're looking at as well, that sometimes the problems are very complicated or you have to go into a long explanation as to why somebody should, should do this. You've got to have what we call a headline. So what is that headline that's going to attract people that you've only got five or ten seconds to say to them? It's easy to understand. They get it right away. Uh, too often, for us in particular, we work with a lot of engineers who are um, very technical, really know all the details of the inner workings of you know the lighting system or the controls with a building and they always want to make something 100 percent accurate and give people all the information so you have to make that trade-off in this book they talk about uh, accuracy versus accessibility and what that means is you've got to try and simplify some of the messages and it's maybe 90 percent correct and you leave out some of the extraneous facts in order that people will actually remember it and will stick with them so you could have that with one of these causes or something that you're, you're interested in doing with people, you've got to try and make it simple and uncomplicated, otherwise people won't have time for it. So again, really good read, really simple. Another obvious one, but we all like to have fun, and that's just another way that you can connect with people. Whether it's as simple as having a little game of tossing something into the, into the hoop, and then you win a prize, or, or have them um, almost like skill testing questions to win a prize, and that's where you could do your education or get people interested and, and learning about your cause. Oops, sorry. Yeah, we'll try this one more time. So these are fun videos that Volkswagen. Not right now. Not right now. And the idea here is that you can change people's activity by making it fun. These ones are quite elaborate, so I'm not suggesting that you would do anything like this. But use this concept and see if there's any way that you can make it more interesting for people.
So there's a few of them like that. There's one um, where they equip a garbage can to have a when you put something in it, like, so it's dropped a thousand feet and everybody's throwing garbage in. Um, so again, you're not going to be able to do these kind of elaborate things, but I think the notion that uh, to engage people to get them interested in what you're talking about, if you can have something fun that they can do, that would be ideal. So I've totally broken it. No, you haven't totally broken it. I think it's actually still okay. okay. So we're going to go with that. Slot, Sorry. Slot. From current slide. Now there's another <laughs> catchphrase or, or thing that you're hearing a lot about. It's called gamification. A lot of people hate that phrase. I actually like it, so that's why I included it in this presentation. Uh, it's the notion that you could actually either make games for people, that we actually have done that as an example, an online game uh, at one point that we call Waste Busters. Uh, they can, it doesn't have to be online, it can be the physical games that I talked about. But the thing that I like the most is that you can use the principles of gamification in anything that you do. So I'll just tell you a story about this gaming guru that came to talk to us. And what he talked about, one of the first things he said was that you have to think of this concept of playing a kazoo. And so this is a kazoo. It's the world's simplest instrument to play. You can learn how to be a master of the kazoo within 30 seconds. Apparently, um, problem with the kazoo is that once you've mastered it, it gets really boring and it really sucks to play. So then you throw it out. Whereas a violin is supposed to be any violin players here? No. Yeah. Violin is supposed to be the most complicated instrument to play, but um, there are different levels to it. So you can never truly master the violin. That you can always do this concept of leveling up. And so that's what I loved in this idea, and one of the key ones that we took from all these gaming theories. So one, you want to be able to feel like you're doing well and making it to the next level, just like any game that you've ever played. And then there has to be that new challenge. But it can't either feel like this is impossible to ever do, and it can't be so easy that it's so boring or repetitive that you quit playing. So it's a good one that you can think of with any of the things that you do. Maybe it's how you would engage people around their education or how they're learning. The other ones, storytelling or exploration. And then the ones that you can do with anything as well as how you rank, giving out rewards, being able to communicate out those bragging rights. So we do that a lot as far as here's people that have saved more than their peers or here's an award for somebody that did an amazing electricity savings project. Everybody likes to compete and have that comparison. Also the idea of random treasures. So even though uh, the idea of getting something for just participating. So you can get something for uh, an achievement, but also if there's random ideas that you may have the ability to get something, that draws people in. Countdown, again, time's running out, limited time offer, and combo bonuses, so the more you do, the more that you save or receive or more entries into a contest, whatever it is. So again, these are all things that work great for actual games, but I also feel like you can use those in your marketing or your communication approaches to try and get people interested and excited. The other big one you've got to remember is that there are a ton of acceptance barriers out there for people, excuses as to why they don't want to do what you're asking them. It could be, be viewed as risky, either personal risk or risk of uh, not fitting in. Do they have to do extra training to figure this out? Oh, I, don't, I hate training. I don't want to have to do that. Is somebody going to get mad at me because I've changed something? We get this a lot with building operators when we have to do the work or we change the way the lighting system or the HVAC system is working. Somebody's going to complain. I don't want to have to deal with that. Also, again, kind of like what we talked about earlier, but just getting any kind of change is a big immovable object. So you've got to remember that. They're going to sit and say, I want it the way I've always wanted it. Don't change me. Other things you've got to think about, they just might not be aware that what you're 
selling, what you're trying to get them to participate in, that it's an issue at all. Oh, I actually really didn't realize that was a problem. So there's the education component. Another one we have to deal with a lot is the product or services might, might not actually be available. So they want to get the efficient lighting or they want to be able to get um, a bike helmet to a poor family, but they don't know how or they don't know where to do that. So you can break down those barriers through advertising, social media. You can work with partners to get uh, products and services available in the marketplace. Another one that's really important for us um, may apply to you guys as well, but we ask people to look at their own process for getting to people to, to participate. So is it onerous? Oh, you want me to sign up here and you want me to give you $10 and oh my God, there's all these steps. I don't want to have anything to do with your, your cause or your program. Make sure it's super simple to do. Another really important one, and, and you, you all know this intuitively and you'll see it with a lot of causes or anything that takes off, is this idea of utilizing the power of norms. And again, that's that bandwagon effect, that seeing that, hey, cool people are doing this or everybody's doing this, I really should too. So an example, at our work, we try and encourage people to join uh, a running club. And what the group was doing before was they said, okay, well, let's meet out in the back and then we'll head out from there. And what I said to them is, that's great that the club is doing that and that they're running, but the mistake you're making is that nobody's seeing you guys coming together and doing this. They don't know that, well, there's actually 10, 12 people that go on this run, meet in a really busy area like the lobby, and then people can say, oh, what are they doing? Oh, I think they go running. Oh, well, we should do that. So you can see how that snowball effect happens. So one more video here, hopefully. This is a really old one. I wasn't actually alive. I know it's hard to believe. So which one do I push? I think we should go with views new hardware. Oh. Okay. And then I got to get that over. Maybe. Uh -oh. <laughs> there we go. The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with the white shirt, the lady with the trench coat, and subsequently, one other member of our staff will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat <laughs> tries to maintain his individuality. But little by little, He looks at his watch, but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more <laughs> to the wall. Now we'll try it once again. Here's the candid subject. Here comes the candid camera staff, three of them at least. And uh, this man has apparently been in groups. <laughs> He makes a full turn to the rear and Charlie closes the door. A moment later, we'll open the door. Everybody's changed positions. <laughs> So again, with anything that you're doing, think about how is it that people are going to see that this is the norm, that there's lots of cool people doing this, or that you know I'm actually in the minority if I'm not taking part of this. And that was one of the things with the cheesy woodsy, uh, woodsy owl commercial I showed at the beginning is that 
they were really good at showing, hey, all these kids are doing their part to pick up the litter, and they're all doing it together. They're all having a good time. Um, so you need to think about that as well. Let's see if I can get it going. Oh, you don't want that again? There we go. Also, the other thing you can do with that, and we've touched on it a few times, but you can create these advocates, right? So your early people that you get involved, get them to go out and sell it or get more people involved as well because people will trust those that they know better than that they know you. So now we're into the last section. We've got about 15 minutes. We'll get through that. This is how you help people to succeed. So they're interested. They're aware. You've removed acceptance issues for them. How can you get them going? So there may be economics that are working against you with whatever you're doing. Um, for us, often it costs more to put in super efficient lighting or super efficient windows. So you need to make sure that you understand that. It could be a real issue that it does cost more, or it could actually just be perceived. So it might not actually be true that it's, that it's more expensive, but they believe that it is. Also, you've got to think about, do people have to do other things in order to do what you're asking them to do? Do they have to close down? Do they have to drive somewhere? Do they have to incur some other costs? Another thing to consider is what's a, who's a partner that you can bring in? So somebody else that will be able to take advantage of this, that it's a win-win, so a local retailer, um, maybe a local group that can bring something to the table. Um, they're, they're not that hard to find these people. They're often interested in trying to help and get involved. The reason we like to do that is because these people that we partner with, they're the trusted source for a lot of people. When you're buying lighting products, you trust the people at Home Depot because you know that they're bringing in the right products, whereas you don't necessarily know what BC Hydro knows about this area. Similarly, if there's a, an association on the North Shore that's all about getting clothes for the homeless, they're gonna, you want to work with them because they're the trusted source for that. Plus, they're just way better at doing that. That's the known channel that people use. That's a big thing. Our example is that um, other utilities in the States, when they wanted to get lighting products into people's hands, they decided, well, we'll do it as efficiently and as cheaply as we can, and so that's, we'll, we'll mail it to them. What they didn't realize is you're not utilizing the channel any longer. What we did was we said, come to the Home Depot or the Rona or the Canadian Tire, pick up your free light bulb, and then what ended up happening was people would buy other products when they were in the store. The staff would be trained on those technologies and people would go back to that location and buy more product uh, a month later. So again, don't try and reinvent these channels, try and use the ones that exist. We also know from lots of social research that commitments actually help people uh, to make a change. So that's why you'll have the, the pledges show up at the bottom of the screen on the telethon. It's that peer pressure that you did commit to do this. They even say that the, the checkbox on an online form that says, I promise that this is true, makes a huge difference, that people will actually follow up on it. Other things we know is to ask for a, a public commitment for people. So you see that this person is committed to do something in front of other people, obviously there's going to be that peer pressure. Another cool one is you can get a whole team of people to commit to do something. Then they'll actually push each other to do it. You see this with exercise, right, that two or three people will make a pact to to go to boot camp in the morning, and then they each kind of support each other and push each other along. It works really well. Also, we've touched on this a couple times, but this is key for any of your things, is make sure you, that you get that new person that you've just signed up, get them involved in the recruiting now. So they're passionate about this, they want to get involved, they're going to be able to sell it, probably as good or better than you, get them to recruit new people. And then the challenging bit is how do you find uh, hold people accountable for what they did without it maybe being seen as coercive or, or uh, we don't want to embarrass people. So that's the fine line that you'd have to walk. But what you could do, again, similar to the telethon, is say, you know, here's the names of all the people that have been so amazing and have helped us and have committed to making a difference. And then obviously they're going to feel that pressure to want to follow through on that. Another thing we know with any kind of change is that it's useful for people to set targets. But this is a, is a balancing act. You want the target, you can either have two targets, one that's lofty or that, that visionary goal. If you're going to do that one, you also have, a, have to have a more attainable or simple goal, again, to get them interested. 
If you find that the goal is way out there, again, people are going to be like, oh, that's way too hard. I can't make a difference. I'm never going to be able to do that. Uh, we've seen that with some uh, climate change programs. The one-ton challenge from the feds is one of them that uh, the whole words one ton, that sounded really big and really hard to people. Whereas if they just said, you know, reduce by 10% or reduce by 20%, that would have seemed more reasonable to somebody. We also know that, again, everybody can have the best intentions with exercise or with anything, but then they'll get stuck as far as how to get started. So you, what you need to think about is how you can be a coach for them or how you can help create a plan. So if you've got somebody signed up, yeah, I want to do this, I want to bring in coats for the homeless or I want to do something around biking, whatever it is, I want to start composting, then you can right away say, okay, let's sit down and work out your 10-day action plan or your one-week action plan. Also, just in life, in work, and in marketing, we know that it's good to give people feedback. And so that they know either that they're doing the right thing, they're doing a great job, or that they need to change and, and move in another direction. Another neat one that you learn, uh, you'll learn one day as parents mm -hmm. is you want to tell people what you want them to do and not what you not, what not want to do. So um, an example of that in the Woodsy Owl campaign, they were showing people picking up the litter, doing all the great things. There was another campaign in the 70s um, where it actually showed people littering, and they were thinking, oh, well, we'll show these people littering, and won't people be disgusted with that? It actually um, did the opposite, that people said, oh, it looks like everybody's littering, so I might as well as well. Whereas this uh, Wizzy one showed people cleaning up, doing the right thing, having fun doing it. You can utilize this in whatever you want to do as well is that any sort of competition or comparison always works. So on our website, we have a, um, where you can see your energy consumption over the week, day, month, and the single biggest uh, button that's pressed on that website, I think it's pressed 10 times more than anything else, is the compare to my neighbor button. <laughs> and we also get the most calls about that. Oh, well, I have a pool and a hot tub and a fountain. Why are you saying that I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in the green? I'm not energy efficient. My neighbor, they don't have any of that stuff. Well, then there's a reason that you consume so much is because of all those things. It totally works. Uh, floor challenges work with businesses. They love that. Or business-to-business -business competitions always work as well. So with any sort of feedback, you have to make sure that there's a way to do that measure and reporting out about how somebody's doing. So for the initiatives you heard about or for what you're thinking about, you'll always want to think about, you know, each week you might want to say, well, we collected... Um, X pounds of, of garbage or compost, or we collected a thousand uh, jackets for the community. Now let's reach the 3,000 point and, and reporting out on that, telling people that they've made a difference in that. And you see this a lot in any sort of exercise apps and a lot of exercise research is that if people do track their weight or the exercise that they're doing, they have way more success than the people that don't. So it can that can be true for anything. Not necessarily that they need to be tracking everything that they're doing, but you need to be providing them tips or feedback on how uh, either the movement or the collective is doing or how they're doing on their own. Also with the feedback, as much as you can, recognize these early adopters or people that are doing great things and don't just reward them or don't just uh, let them know that they're doing a great job. Try and do it in a form like this where there's that, uh, again, that uh, pressure that, oh, I want to be like that person. I want to do well. We do that with our Power Smart Excellence Awards with um, our commercial customers. And what we find is the people that come in second or the runner-ups, they're always talking to their key account manager the next day and saying, next year, I better win that award. And what do we need to do to, to get there? So reward the people, make them feel good about what they've done, but use that to your advantage. Tell everybody else the incredible things that that one person accomplished and that they can do it as well. So finally, last things to think about, um, you obviously strive to get this, this movement or this big snowball that occurs where everybody starts talking about it, like the crazy ice bucket challenge, you know, but you only hit those, those nuggets or those golds uh, very occasionally. But there's things that you can remember to try and do your best to get that snowball happening. Social media will obviously help you in that regard. The other thing that you have to remember, and it may be less so um, with these projects, but for your careers, and, and I made this mistake for years, is that I always assumed that everybody was like at the bottom, 
here that you, it's always a stage and okay now they understand this and much about power smart now I'll take you to the next level the next level that kind of idea what I understand now is that as life gets busy or changes then your motivation drops or dips and you have to re-engage them so it's not necessarily this step function it's that you have to have these ways to continually reconnect with people and make sure that they're interested in your cause or your product and service or in our case power smart because people will fall off the wagon they'll forget what they're supposed to do there's all the research about you know how many days weeks something has to happen before it becomes a habit the part that often isn't in that research again is that if now you have a new baby or you move or you just get married or a new job all of a sudden all that those habits could be thrown out the window so you have to find those ways to reconnect with people what's those prompts to tell them this is what you need to continue to do so that can be newsletters that can be uh, events that you hold regularly that can be um, again to steal from uh, one area that we actually looked at a lot um, not for what they're trying to solve but Alcoholics Anonymous that's what their whole foundation is about is, a, is that get the person out of the environment where they feel like having a drink get them into those group team meetings and that's their prompt to remember that this is what's important to them now to make that change so you can have similar things obviously not um, as serious or a serious scale like that but fun things that reconnect with people and get them re-energized about your, your cause, your product, your service. So that's it. We made it. I'm actually two minutes early. That's probably a first for me. So those are the three things to remember. Again, I hope that you can see that this works great for causes and for sustainability, for conservation. But you can use a lot of these things for any career that you're in, whether it's to get more people to travel to BC or to come to your tourist attraction, whatever it might be, your hotel, anything. You can think of a lot of these principles and use them in your marketing, in the way you uh, build loyalty with your customers, what you want to do with them. Because again, remembering that those customers are able to be advocates for you or, uh, we didn't talk about it here, but a disgruntled customer or participant can do a lot of damage to you. And you've seen that a lot with social media where they'll share their bad TripAdvisor review or there was a, I think you probably all saw the um, United Breaks Guitars where uh, one fellow was a musician, United broke his very expensive guitar and he got, he got the runaround from all their customer service people. So we actually created a YouTube video um, and song that, you know, got a million hits and you better believe that United was wished that they had wished that they had solved his problem earlier because they got a lot of bad press. So again, you can, these things can all help for good, but you also have to remember that try and deal with people that are having problems or are dissatisfied because they can cause a lot of damage for you. And I think that is it. Good. Thanks. So we do have a little bit of time. Yeah, I think so. We have time. So I'm just going to see if So yeah, any questions, thoughts? Come on, <laughs> students. It's a lot to absorb, but again, again, it's not, none of it's rocket science. I think it's just common sense that either sometimes people forget or they just, again, got caught up in the day-to-day. -day. And so that's maybe my last message to you is that when you do uh, leave school and you're in your careers, it's really easy to, again, get caught up in the day-to-day, -day, you know, the the product that you've got to get out that night or the report that you've got to have completed that afternoon. Um, we all get caught up in that busyness and we don't do that reconnection with sociology, psychology. We don't take the time to read and think about things a little differently. We don't take the time to go out and actually watch our customers shop, participate, complain. Uh, really important that you, you remember to do that when you're, when you're out in the workforce. And I think it will help you with your projects as well. It totally will. So to tie it all back together in the beginning, you know, I was saying people have to be, oh, sure, <laughs> I want the cool headset, for sure. Um, I was saying in the beginning, people, you know, we had a lot of passion in our projects, but you saw those projects that one, they did research, and as Jim was saying, it doesn't have to be complicated, you know, go to the organizations, ask them what they need, watch your fellow students or watch the group. Um, you know, those two guys threw a party in a pub. They didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Where are students? What are they doing on the weekend? What are they interested in? You want to watch a video of Red Bull Rampage? We will get that for you, and we will charge you a price, and we will make this happen. So 
I think that um, not only was Jim's presentation absolutely 100% useful for project change, but as he said, also as professional tourism marketers going forward, I'm going to take some of this home to my household and use this on my kids and my husband. So um, really big thanks and another round of applause for Jim. Thank you so much for being here. I don't see any questions from BIU, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, and say that's a wrap for the webinar. Uh, Jim and I will maybe hang out for a couple minutes in case there's any, you know, anything pops up, any other individual questions. Well, just while I'm shutting this down, we'll kind of be at the front here. But thank you for your time and attention. Thanks to the folks over at VIU, and uh, have a great weekend. Great. Thank you. Thank you.